from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. We start in Argentina, where the Minister of Economy, Nicolás Duhovny, has met with the Chief of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, to request a financing package. Argentina is asking the institution for a standby ag arrangement, meaning a program involving financial aid by the IMF, and in return, the IMF might impose reforms that it considers necessary for the recipient country to help its economy. In its search for financial assistance, President Macri's government has also requested aid from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Development Bank of Lat Latin America. And in light of President Macri's economic policies, there are more protests in Argentinian streets. A correspondent in Argentina, Edgardo Esteban, has more details. University professors have given a press conference here in Plaza Constitución. They asked for a salary increase of more than 25% due to the increase in the cost of living, which is greater than 24%. The constant failings of Macri's government have prompted teachers and professors from all over the country to plan a demonstration in the nation's capital on May 17. In particular, the demonstration will target the neoliberal policies of Macri's government. In this press conference, they also talk about the concern that people have because of the agreement that Argentina is building with IMF, because they anticipate that the workers will be the most affected by the deal. That was Edgardo Esteban from Buenos Aires. Guatemala has asked the government of Venezuela and Sweden to withdraw their ambassadors from the country. It accused them of improperly interfering in domestic politics. Guatemala's foreign ministry said it was not declaring the diplomats persona non grata, However, it said it would wait for the governments of Sweden and Venezuela to present new ambassadors. Sweden has called the incident very unfortunate, saying they will seek further explanation from the Guatemalan government and then decide on a course of action. We confirm that we have asked Venezuela and Sweden to withdraw their ambassadors from Guatemala, but this doesn't mean they are personas non gratas. Guatemala has excellent relations with both countries. We inform the foreign ministries of each country about the decision. We talk to both ambassadors to tell them what Guatemala foreign policy is. We hope both countries can have new ambassadors as quick as possible. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has announced that Isla Margarita, one of the country's most important tourist locations, is to be made into a special economic area for the use of the Petro cryptocurrency. Maduro was speaking at a campaign rally in Nueva Esparta on Thursday, where he asked supporters to unite as times of prosperity, change and hope lie ahead. President Maduro is pushing the Petro as a major tool to combat external economic sanctions. Maduro previously announced that the cryptocurrency will be used to open a youth bank with 20 million units, which he says are collectively worth $1.2 billion. And at the center of the coming election in Venezuela is the challenge of overcoming the country's economic difficulties, especially the supply of basic goods at affordable prices. Ian Bruce has been to a community factory in Caracas that is trying to do just that. We're here at the Mastranta Chemical Industries in Antimono, that's a popular neighborhood of Caracas. This is a community enterprise set up by eight engineers and the local community to try and combat the shortage of many materials, in this case, soap, which is one of the most difficult things for people to buy in the present conditions in the so-called economic war. Now, let's have a look at how the process works. This is soap entirely made with local ingredients. There's uh, palm oil in these containers over here, which is then mixed with the other ingredients over here into the paste. The paste is then put into these containers here and left to dry. After that, it's brought over to here. It's emptied out of the containers and the, and the workers here begin to cut it up into small pieces. 
Uh, now, the people working here, as I say, are mostly from the local community, from some of the local community organizations. The company started, uh, the, the, pro the project started as a cooperative two years ago, but they've been producing for six months now. And let's have a look at the final product. So the small pieces of soap that the workers were cutting up are put into this machine here, comes out as this kind of spaghetti looking stuff. It's left to dry for a little while and then it's taken to this machine over here. Let's see how that works. So it comes up here, they put it into the, into the, into the funnel there and it comes out as this continuous stream of soap here which is then chopped up into the bars of soap. The company is currently producing 220,000 bars of soap a month. About 10% of that goes to the local food supply and production committees the, which distribute them in the neighborhoods to people's homes. And then it comes over here and it goes into the uh, wrapping machine here. And finally, it's put in the, pla in the plastic covers into the boxes. They say the capacity here could be as much as a million bars of soap a month, but to do that, they need to speed up the chemical process. At the moment, the process of mixing the chemicals is a little bit slow to reach that volume of production, but it's still a significant contribution to the grave shortage and the very high prices which people suffer to buy basic, uh, basic goods like soap and other items of domestic hygiene. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza is in Cuba to participate in the final session of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the ECLAC. Arreaza made a call for unity as the only way to achieve peace and prosperity. He spoke about the way colonialism is still affecting many societies. Today, as never before, we need to defend multilateralism and the rule of international law to open a world of peace and prosperity and knowledge. But on the contrary, the disregard of multilateralism and the avoidance of international law is getting more and more common. This puts peace, prosperity, human development, and even life itself at risk. Inequality is not natural. It is a consequence of colonialism and neocolonialism. Yesterday, we convened a meeting in Caracas with African and Caribbean countries to seek reparations for the Afro-descendant people, and we can show how slavery still has effects in our society and in our structures. With high expectations, peace dialogues between the National Liberation Army and the government of Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos resumed on Thursday in Havana. Cuba is once again the headquarters of a peace dialogue, this time hosting talks between the National Liberation Army and the Colombian government. We do not hesitate to once again accept the responsibility of hosting the peace process in Colombia, in this case creating space to hold the fifth cycle of dialogues. We do it in accordance with the principles of Latin America and the Caribbean as a peace zone. The head of the Colombia Peace Delegation, Gustavo Bell, called for decisive steps towards agreeing on a stable and robust ceasefire that will make it possible to arrive to Election Day in peace. This is a process with a rhythm that anticipates reasonable optimism, that we can have concrete and favorable results in the medium term that will move us forward. There will be a time when Colombian society will be responsible with continuing these dialogues, independent of the government that is elected during the next elections. The head of the ELN negotiating team, Pablo Bertrand, reiterated that the only viable path to resolve the Colombian conflict is dialogue. This process has two main objectives. First, to get violence out of politics. We are two parties and each must put forth effort to make sure this happens. And second, we must work towards transformation in Colombia, because nothing will be done unless there is a transformation that changes the conditions that generate the raising of arms. Beltran assured that no level of adversity can make the ELN abandon the dialogue.
However, he said that he was concerned that even after the demobilization of the FARC EP, there is a political genocide against the opposition. Nailing down a bilateral ceasefire and defining mechanism for the participation of society in the construction of peace will be the topics of discussion during this fifth cycle of conversation that resume in Havana. We'll take a short break now by joining us after this video from our multimedia team. to my apartment. Welcome back. Colombian local media has reported former FARC leader Jesus Santrich has ended his hunger strike after 32 days. Santrich went on strike after he was arrested at the request of the United States on alleged drug trafficking charges. Human rights activists and politicians asked him to go off the hunger strike so that he can live to create peace. The Ecuadorian government will give declassified information to the relatives of the journalists kidnapped and murdered in the Colombian border last April. Foreign Minister Maria Fernanda Espinosa announced that the handing of these documents will take place next Monday. Relatives, however, are also demanding clarifications from President Lenin Moreno on the circumstances of the murder. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been banned from receiving visitors and phone calls at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London, where he has been living since 2012. Ecuador's Foreign Minister confirmed Assange's communications were being restricted even further. Back in March, his internet access was blocked after he tweeted condemnation of Britain's response to the poisoning of Russian former intelligence officer Sergei Skripal and his daughter. The Ecuadorian government said Assange breached a written commitment not to issue messages that might interfere with other states. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas continues his tour of Chile, the country that has the largest number of Palestinians outside the Arab world. The president took a break from his agenda to visit the Palestinian soccer team based in Chile, which according to Mahmoud Abbas is like the second national team of Palestine. Nosotros, eh, estamos acá we are here representing our people and identity. Having the president of Palestine in our stadium, in our home, is the greatest honor for us. Chile is home to the largest Palestinian community outside the Arab world. 
The migration started during the late 1800s and increased after the Nakba in 1947. The international community and Chilean government must compromise to realize the Palestinian dream of being a free nation, just like any other country in the world. During these days, we remember 70 years of the Nakba, or Palestinian catastrophe, which started with 800,000 Palestinians expelled from their homes. Farid Saran and her family are one of many Palestinians who immigrated to Chile. This forms a strong bond between the Palestinian youth and their roots in a political way. These young people are also fighting for the Palestinian cause by participating in the Federation, the soccer team, and even producing TV shows. Even though they were born in Chile, they choose to move to Palestine to fight for the cause they inherited. But they were grateful too. My cousins told me that our grandmother didn't like it here. She always wanted to go back to Petala. But for us, everything has been really good. That's the reason for Mahmoud Abbas's visit to Chile, to strengthen bonds between the two nations. The Palestinian people have the right to be autonomous and Chile will always support that cause. I deeply appreciate the support we've received for our people. This is an example of the support that Palestine continues to call from the international community. In Chile, a female student movement is challenging the education system by demanding a university environment free of sexism, harassment and sexual abuse. The movement was born after students revealed they are exposed to concerning levels of physical, psychological and sexual violence. 600 students launched a protest after their complaints were ignored and it has since spread across the nation. At least 30 institutions and hundreds of protesters are supporting the movement and calling for university directors to promote gender equality on campus. Mexican Interior Minister Alfonso Navarrete announced the arrest of a third suspect in the murder of three film students who were kidnapped outside the city of Guadalajara on March 19. Navarrete said the suspect was arrested during a federal police raid in central Mexico after a manhunt crossing four states that involved several national security agencies. The Interior Minister added that authorities are still searching for a fourth and final suspect in this case. Investigators blame the Jalisco New Generation drug cartel for the murders. Still in Mexico, hundreds of mothers marched for their disappeared children and demanded the government to return them home on Mother's Day. Dozens of families gathered in Mexico City under intense heat while holding signs that read, Hold on, mom is looking for you. And other that said, no more disappearances. Mothers said they will continue to look for their loved ones and will do whatever and go wherever to find them. They also protested for the rise of the number of people disappeared, which reached more than 30,000 at the end of 2016. Many of them are feared dead. Today I would like to ask the government to give us a present for Mother's Day. The present I'm asking for is that it help us find our children. I feel powerless knowing that there are so many missing persons. It is not fair that this government doesn't do anything for them. We move to Barbados where the opposition Barbados Labour Party has launched their manifesto, laying out plans for the country if they win the election. The Mia madly led DLP is promising free education for Barbadian students at the University of the West Indies. A major tax reform to go along with wage increases for public servants and the restructuring of Barbados foreign debt. All tonight, but I will address a few for you. Because the first thing we have to do within the first four weeks of office is to deal with the fact that our foreign reserves are falling and that we have a foreign debt payment of $120 million to pay in June. That is why I shall forever hold Frondel Stewart responsible for carrying us to the edge in calling this election. It is wickedness on stilts. The ruling Democratic Labour Party in Barbados continues to remind citizens of its progress during its term. 
At a rally on Thursday, candidates reminded citizens they created the first ever youth policy and implemented the Cultural Industries Act, which was created for entertainers and artists to make money. The DLP says they have been able to do a number of things with scarce resources. Opposition leader and former president of Guyana, Barat Jagdeo, plans to raise a motion in parliament over the fishermen who were murdered by pirates in Suriname's waters in late April. Jagdeo criticized the government for not doing more to ensure the safety of fishermen. He accused the government of acting like it was business as usual after the incident. He wants the government to work more closely with their Suriname counterparts, saying Sur Surinamese police often disregard reports of piracy because the victims are Guyanese. We'll take one last short break, but join us at this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. Welcome back. Tens of thousands of Iranians have taken to the streets to protest against the decision by U.S. President Donald Trump to withdraw from the 2015 Iran nuclear agreement. Protests have been organized in different cities of the country. Trump pulled out of the deal on Tuesday, saying it was defective at its core. He also threatened to reimpose sanctions on Iran. This has frustrated many Iranians who believe this decision will lead to more economic hardship. And following the withdrawal, German Chancellor Angela Merkel said this does not affect Europe's position. She added that she will explore all the possibilities with Iran to save the deal without the United States. The termination of the nuclear deal with Iran is a matter of great concern and regret. This deal is the result of 12 years of work, a very long diplomatic process, and probably far away from ideal. I would rather engage in the transatlantic partnership in which things always work out and referring to how we can keep this agreement alive without a great economic power. French President Emmanuel Macron also asked Iran to remain committed to the nuclear deal and urge de-escalation after dozens of Syrian targets were hit in the biggest Iranian-Israeli flare-up. Let's not abandon what we did almost three years ago and avoid all escalation. Unfortunately, last night you saw there were strikes between Iran and Israel. There is a risk of escalation and growing tensions. We must be very vigilant to avoid that. Students in Madrid, Spain, continue protests against the verdict of a court deciding that they cleared five men of a teenager's gang rape. Demonstrators marched in outrage over the wolf pack the gang rape case that was named after a WhatsApp group chat where the five men bragged about the assault. 
The men were accused of raping a woman at a 2016 bull running festival, but were convicted of a lesser crime, sexual abuse. Catalonia's parliament will vote on Saturday to approve Kim Torra as the new leader of the region. Torra's name was suggested by the deposed leader, Carles Puigdemont. Kim Torra is a lawyer and journalist who has been active in the pro-independence movement. His appointment means that Catalans could have a government as early as next week. Catalonia has been without a government since December, after the regional election ended in a standoff between the Spanish government and the former leader, Puigdemont. He is currently living in Berlin, waiting for German courts to rule on a Spanish request to extradite him on a charge of misuse of public funds. A delegation of the Venezuelan indigenous Pemon people is in Germany to bring back a sacred stone that was stolen 20 years ago. A correspondent, Ibai Arbide, brings us this story. Finally, the day has arrived for the Venezuelan Pimon people to perform a healing ritual before the Quake Stone, placed in Berlin. The stone was stolen 20 years ago and brought both the Pimon people and the Venezuelan government to fight for all these years to bring it back to its origin. Today, a delegation formed by ten shamans, five men and five women, has arrived here to start the return process for the Quake Stone to Venezuela. I'm here with my children, with my grandchildren, with the delegation. We don't really know how we arrived here, but we do know that we come from far away and that we are happy to meet this stone, which is our grandmother. We are happy to be with our grandmother, Cueca, and that she's going to come back with us. We will see how long it will take for the stone to return. The Venezuelan people, and especially the Piedmont community, are waiting for her. That was Ibai Arbide from Berlin. And now we've come to the end of this news brief. For this and other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And be sure to follow us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching. Telesur features the developments of science and technology that innovate and make the world go around.